Was ist los? It's your German boy, and welcome back to Planetarian. Now, last time, uh, we stumbled upon the remains of a bombed-out liquor store as we were walking our new android girl off to our car so we can abscond off to the nearest settlement. So, where we last left off, we were going to try to find out if there was anything left in there. Well, I've got my fix. So, let's see if Protag can get his. Certainly, if I search carefully, I might be able to find a surviving bottle or two. But the current state of affairs would allow me no such luxury. If only the destruction were at least partial. Full of regret, I returned to the entrance and looked at the place that had once been a liquor shop being beaten down by the rain. Time to go. Well, that was a bust. Just when I exited the shop, I noticed something green that had hitherto been concealed shining on the side of the footpath. I drew near to it, stepping on the fragmented concrete. Just as I thought, this was a bottle of what was probably high-grade liquor. SCORE! <laughs> The cardboard display case long since rotted away, but the bottle itself seemed unbroken. The moment I stretched out my hand to grab it, the last moment of a pitiful old man flashed through my mind. A booby trap, huh? Though the potential for being such a trap was low, it was still much better to be safe than sorry. I surveyed my surroundings. I couldn't see any wires or trip plates anywhere. The other possibility was... At that moment, a hand stretched out from beside me and grabbed the liquor bottle. Uh -huh. I didn't even have the inclination to get angry with her anymore. And so I merely received the bottle in silence. <laughs> It was a simple cylindrical bottle, holding what was unmistakably distilled liquor. I immediately broke its seal and opened the plastic cap. This had been the first time I'd broached the seal of one of my prizes in the location I'd found it in, but I didn't care at this point. As I drew the bottle to my face hole in order to partake of it, an exquisite aroma at that time had not decayed one bit filled my nose. This was unmistakably a fine blended whiskey. This one prize for all my troubles. A smile spilled out of me involuntarily. Though my situation was still as bad as it ever was, I still felt good, as if some weight had been lifted off my shoulders. She asked just as I was about to taste the liquor. Why do you ask that? You have a good memory. Then remember one more thing. This is my medicine. As I passed the bottle before her eyes, she very conscientiously read the label. <laughs> You're well informed. How wonderful. I took the opportunities that the Chatterbox's words of gratitude presented, and I took a swig of the bottle's contents. I quickly choked. The scotch. First I imbibed in months was so strong that my body vomited it back up. I took another sip, this time in order to save as a flavor. The air that rushed into me from the bottle was saturated with alcohol, and I could feel the warmth of the liquor in my stomach. Not bad. I mean, if it's scotch, of course it's gonna be good, but... Eh, listen to us. Yes, 
Have you ever tried some? Of course. That's too bad. In order to do my teetotal robot companion honor, I took another swig. Now, if I could only have some cigarettes, this world would be heaven itself. She simply gazed at the destroyed shop, a smile floating to her face. Her shoulders, entirely covered by his waterproof cloak, looked somewhat unsteady to me. As a rubble, washed by his unbroken sheets of rain, glimmered a dull silver color. I sealed the whiskey bottle to its original airtight state, and then secured it into a pocket of my backpack. We took a course northwest from there. Because I had chosen to walk through the alleyways, it was difficult to tell where we were. However, I could tell that we were making progress towards a quarantine wall. The air was rife with the stench of rainwater. I could sense no ill will from the continuous falling of the rain. The sarcophagus city, having lost its protective dome, was like an open-faced water tank. Perhaps the entirety of the east side of the city was thus slightly submerged in water. If that was the case, then the likelihood of having to fight off a patrol of heavy combat units in this area was low. It appeared that unless there were patrols that hugged the quarantine wall, we'd evaded the warmongers for now. Perhaps because it'd grown much colder since the signs that we left, she appeared in good, in good condition as well. She walked slightly ahead of me, repeating her usual phrase to herself. This town was now hers. Although the roads were immersed in water, she didn't seem to mind at all. With a gate that verged on a dance, she walked along these sidewalks that were devoid of people. The traffic lights, bereft of light, and the road signs, bereft of faces, were simply and quietly bidding her farewell. Both the hush of buildings and this robot shaped like a young woman had no duty any longer. And the hundreds of millions of raindrops. It was a scene that made the depths of my heart ache, much like a vague reverie that would vanish by dawn. She came to a stop at a rift in the sidewalk and turned in a circle, surveying her surroundings. She then fell into a puddle of water with a grand splash. This was already the 14th time, my god. Well, if my memory served, that was. So it could be more, could be less. I guess we'll never know. I told you not to look around, did I not? All these balls don't seem to have damaged you, at least. That's is good. Good to know, good to know. I didn't know whether this was the truth or a joke, but she beamed radiantly all the same. Water dripped briskly from the cloak I'd lent her. She probably really did like the rain after all. Perhaps it was due to the alcohol that I had just imbibed, but I found myself thinking that way. Before long, her gait slackened. Do you need a break? Okay. Yeah. The same casual exchange of words that I knew in how many times we had repeated. The bouquet hanging from my backpack clinked like some kind of protective talisman along with my footsteps. She spoke those words like a stale joke every single time we came across barricades and barbed wire entanglements. Probably something like that. Really 
Yeah, it's just the two of us. Yeah, and we'll get to do that when we get to the settlement. She talked as we continue to wander about. Hey. Hi. Don't you ever get bored? You've worked at the planetarium for the entirety of your operational lifespan, correct? Have you not ever thought about trying a completely different line of work? This was an abrupt question even coming from me. Why would she, someone who had adhered so strictly to her professional duties, decide to abandon her post today and follow me instead? It may have been that the answers to those two questions were not so dissimilar. I thought she would say as much. Fucking based. ですが、私は今の仕事がとても気に入っています。館長さんやスタッフの皆さんや家野さんと一緒に働くことはとても楽しくやりがいがあります。I see. I responded curtly as I looked out at the foggy rain in my path. If I just walked into its midst, I would be able to return. Back to the world that I lived in since the day I was born. Back to the world in which I had no choice but to live. However, that was not her world. The only things that would await her when she returned to her beloved workplace were a projector that would never function again, and an eternity of time. Take this reality, being broken and corrupted by the unending rain, and to change it into the meager dreams of which she spoke. Was there not any way to make it happen? She finally opens her mouth again. What is it? Nine. I think I've answered that question before. You have a good memory. I've not yet heard from you, but it is that uh, you pray for. Then what do you pray for? I asked. She stood in the midst of furious rain. She looked back at me and then spoke slowly. She stared at me like a child desperately looking for confirmation. Is that so? She smiled bashfully. For her, these words are probably just an extension of her idle talk. But I'm starting to think of other things altogether. 
When we departed from the planetarium, she had said that if I continue in current pattern of usage, then my battery will last for four more days. She probably not thought that the way would be so long and harsh. 9. It was doubtful that she thought that even now. In other words, her batteries would be running out quite soon. If her battery were to cut out by the time we reached the Land Rover, then I'd be able to bring her out of the city without having to worry how soon. Ooh, now you're thinking, now you're thinking like I'm true, Daishis boy. She called out to me, sounding worried. Nine, I'm fine. Nine, we are almost there. She again smiled sweetly. I gazed uneasily into the rain, feeling as if she'd seen all the way through me. I thought about taking a little swig from the whiskey bottle, but I eventually decided against it. I had already been drunk well past my limit even before I encountered that bottle of whiskey. But how? Where, where were you getting your supply from? Because you said all you had was a bunch of hardtack in your bag. Like, where did all of this booze just manifest itself from? The face of that old junker partner of mine suddenly came to mind. I didn't do nothing. I had not heeded that advice, and it may well have been that the time for me to pay the price for not listening was nigh. What was I to do with her? What exactly was I planning on doing with her? Unable to find an answer to these questions, I simply walked into the midst of the rain. The precise sound of her footsteps vanished that instant. Wait here. I'll return in three minutes. I need to go to the bathroom. She simply smiled back warmly at me as if my excuse were perfectly logical. Be quiet now. I reminded her once again as I checked the safety of my grenade launcher. Maintaining a low, as low a profile as I could, I made my way under the shadow of rubble. Just as I had thought, this alley connected back up to the main street that past, stretched past the front of the train station I had seen on my way in. The totally abandoned road continued straight for about 300 meters and then abruptly ended in a barricade. And after that, the town itself abruptly ended. This was the buffer zone. At the time of the entrenchment into the city as a fortress, the slums that had originally been here had all been demolished to give the machine tools space to work. This also served to make the detection of intruders easy. To that end, the few buildings that were left standing were appropriated as watchtowers. The flat earth, as boggy as a swamp, was expressionlessly reflecting the lead-colored sky. Earth is not flat, you fucking idiots. A wind was blowing through its midst. And beyond that, there rose an enormous reinforced concrete wall out of the midst. The only way out was through that rift in the quarantine wall caused by the kamikaze strike of an autonomous assault mech. It was through there that I'd entered the town. The alcohol I imbibed suddenly made its presence felt. As I shifted positions, I felt a stabbing sharpness writhing in my stomach. I took my binoculars out of my backpack and twirled the focus ring. What the fuck is that? 
there was something that was being pounded on by the rain. An old combat mech. A four-legged walker. It stood before the rift in the quarantine wall, its spikes driven into the sludge. Slightly elevated gun turret and a sensor radome mounted to its side. The barrel of the railgun, so large it would border on misshapen, that projected from the other end. Not an energy module or an attachment loader mech in sight. In other words, it was in solo operations mode. Its turn signals and its brake lights, totally unbecoming in an autonomous weapons platform, were evidence that it had been manufactured during a time when human law still existed. Its twin machine guns, purpose for proximity defense, were swiveling in anticipatory sweeps. A fiddler crab. A Mark 43 LE autonomous fire support mech. That was its official designation, but during the war, just about everyone called it a fiddler crab. Its external frame, constructed for heavy towing, its reinforced rear legs, and its unique barrel jacket mechanism were the specific characteristics that gave it the LE designation. Unlike the mentioned Jaegers I'd met on the way in, this mech was not a rampant warmonger manufactured and online that one of the myriad autonomous airborne factories that had once filled the skies. 9. This was part of the vanguard of DFARS. The autonomous defense line first deployed when the city was first quarantined. It had the ability to fire just about any kind of bullet with insulated coating into the far distance at hypersonic speed. There was no way for infantry to fight against such a powerful heavy mechanized unit. But as it did have manual override controls, if one could capture it, then one could turn it into one's own personal hunter-killer tank. More than anything else, a certain death awaited anyone foolish enough to try. If means had ever been deployed to neutralize the man-made bacteria, these cities would then become valuable strategic points over which large-scale battles would be fought. This fellow is probably left here as a trump card just in case such an eventuality would occur. It continued to go about its duties now, regardless of the fact that while it had hibernated, the entire world had changed, and the thing that it had been tested to protect had long ago been eaten away by time and the rain. A certain kind of awe arose within me at the sight. Boss? Rick. An autonomous fire support mech. Why is it here, of all places? Wait. Why are you here? I told you to wait where you were. Were you planning on perving out on me as I was taking a dump? Bruh. I get it, so be quiet. She nodded obediently. You may ask, but whether I can answer or not is an entirely different matter. It's just as you see it. It's a fiddler crab. It's something similar to you. Look, just silence for a second. I surveyed the scene with my binoculars once again. Where had it come from? When I'd entered the city, there had been no indication that any autonomous defense patrol activity in the area. It was as if it'd come out to set a trap for me while I was in the planetarium. But if that were the case, 
then there would not just be one mech flying in wait. It was also possible that it entered solo operations mode after the power to its nest had been cut off. If I could not silence it with my first shot, then it was very likely that it would call support from its comrades in the vicinity. If I chose to fight, then I did have a, then did I have a chance of victory after all? As Fiddler Crabs were designed as defensive fire support platforms, they had been built largely without taking close proximity combat into consideration. I knew of a few weak points, but there was only one that could be pierced by a 40mm grenade. I would have no choice but to aim at the ammunition bay hatch located at the top of the barrel apparatus. There was probably a 50% chance, 9, more like a 30% chance that I would actually hit it. Given that, could I take a detour? Would I be able to cross past the quarantine wall at any other point in that rift? 9. If I just walked around blindly, since the danger of running into an enemy patrol would just increase. But it would be suicide to pass the night here as well. I'm going out to hunt. You don't know what that means? And sure enough, she cocked her head to signify that she neither understood the situation, nor the words I had spoken. I put away the binoculars. She continued to look on with a very curious air. That was just as well, for I myself did not have the confidence to tell her what was going to happen after this. Remain here until I come back. If you don't, it may cost me my life. She said, very primly clasping her hands before her. I see. So this is the way I should have ordered her about. All the uneasiness I felt just melted away. But finally, there remained one thing that I had to do. I'll be leaving the city soon. After we part, what do you plan on doing? The city is uninhabited. Even if you were able to return to that planetarium, you'll never again have any customers. And you'll never again have a chance to show any of the stars. The power supply to the city is at an end. The projector will never operate again. You've seen all of this with your own two eyes. Hi. I could see the inner lenses of her synthetic eyes moving in to focus in on me. I kept trying to tell myself that this was just a machine. That her responses to me were nothing more than an algorithmic responses to my observed speech and conduct. And then she spoke. Her response to me up until this point was exactly as I had expected. Listen very closely to what I'm about to say and remember it well. Before you leave this place in one way or the other, make your choice based on the realities that you see here. Neither you nor the planetarium are necessary for this city any longer. If you wish to continue to work for humans, then you have no choice but to come with me. And even if you do come with me, I will not be able to know if it will make you happy, nor will I be able to guarantee it. It's your choice whether you stay or whether you come with me. She replied immediately. 
ですがお客様のお話からこれからの行動を決定するには情報が不足していると考えます And you have no means of gaining any more data. You understand this, right? Now that she understood the support center no longer functioned, she was made completely autonomous. It was perhaps true that her paradigm of action had become dependent in the greatest part on me. For instance, because I told her that I was sick, she had chosen to escort me regardless of the fact that her battery was about to die. But I had never wanted such a thing. She had shown me the stars. So in turn, I was trying to show her the future that I alone could give her. The fact that she was not human but a robot did not matter. This was the bond between her and me, and the only proper exchange. Think about it until I come back. And I think this is a good place to leave things off. I better get ready for the battle. Till next time, this has been your boy, Vita Zan.